So, Luke chapter 9, verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparation for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow looks back and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word of our Lord. May he add his blessing to the reading of it. You may be seated. And let's pray again together. Almighty God, as we approach this passage of Scripture, as we consider the response of three would-be disciples to Jesus and to his call to follow him, Lord, we pray that through the power of your Spirit that you would shine your light into our hearts. Lord, that you would help us to see the obstacles that we face. The obstacles that, that tempt us or distract us or divert us or delay us from following you. Lord, we pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit that all of us, would turn and follow you. Lord, we pray uh, for those who are here who are regenerate, those who are, are truly Christians. And, and Lord, we all know these, these temptations. We all know these distractions. We all know these obstacles. Help us, Lord, to, to cling to you and to turn to you and for, for the strength that we need in the face of these obstacles. Lord, I pray for those among us, for those who are here who are unbelievers, who are not yet born again. You would help them to see that the obstacles that are before them, the excuses that they are throwing up before you, excuses that, so that they would say that they, they cannot follow you. Help them to see that it is impossible but by the power of your Spirit. Help them, Lord, to, through the power of your Spirit, turn to you in repentance and in faith. We pray, Lord, that you would grant them new life in Christ. And that there would be even some among us <clears throat> this morning who would become disciples and would follow you wherever you lead. We pray this in the omnipotent, omnipotent name of Jesus Christ, the only Savior. Amen. We have been following the disciples as the disciples have been following Jesus. And the disciples have been stumbling along the road of following Jesus. It hasn't been going very well for the disciples since they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And after the repeated failures of the disciples, the lack of faith that kept them from healing the demon-possessed boy, 
their failure to understand what Jesus was saying about his death, their pride towards each other in wrangling about who was the greatest, their pride towards outsiders in in trying to block an outsider from casting out demons, and their pride towards perceived enemies, the Samaritans, by wanting to call down fire from heaven against them. It is clear from these things that these disciples do not yet understand discipleship. They wanted position. They wanted power. But discipleship most often means dishonor and deprivation. And we know these things. We know what it feels like. And we know that these things make us feel like the road is harder. But brothers and sisters, that is the road. That is the road. As Jesus has set his mind resolutely towards Jerusalem, disciples must set their minds resolutely towards Jesus. They must Follow him. Disciples must follow Jesus. People, even people who claim to follow Jesus, people who claim to be Christians, find all kinds of excuses so as not to follow Jesus. We're going to see that here in our passage this morning. German poet Christian Friedrich Hebel famously said, whoever wants to be judge of human nature should study man's excuses. And ironically, he proved the truth of his own statement in ending a long-time relationship with a woman who had stood by him and helped him a great deal in order to marry a wealthy actress. And he did so on the grounds, as he said, a man's First duty is to the most powerful force within him, that which alone can give him happiness and be of service to the world. Hebel regarded his poetry as the most powerful force within him. And he saw this wealthy actress as the means of enabling him to be able, the financial means to be able to pursue it. And so he judged this marriage as the best action of his life. And as he said, based on the peace of his conscience. Hebel's excuse for leaving the the, the relationship and marrying for money reveals a lot about his character. His sense of of self-importance and self-interest led to self-indulgence. His poetry wasn't the most powerful impulse within him. It was his pride. And it seared his conscience so that he couldn't even see that he was in the wrong. Well, this example gives us a glimpse glimpse into human nature. People's self-importance and self-interest leads to self-indulgence in myriad ways. And these things sear consciences and blind eyes. But this morning, we're talking about rejecting Jesus Christ because of these things. As bad as it was, not just just rejecting an earthly relationship, but rejecting a relationship with Jesus Christ because of these things. So this morning, we're going to be seeing the excuses of three would-be disciples as to why they will not follow Jesus, as to why they reject Jesus' uh, call to follow them. And people give many similar reasons as to why they will not follow Jesus. But the key to understanding their hearts and ours, well, we can get a glimpse in the excuses. The key is not in the excuses themselves, but in the response of Jesus to the excuses. And so in this passage, Jesus is identifying the obstacles of worship. Now, there are three would-be disciples that divides neatly into three points. Verses 57 and 58, we see the obstacle of worldliness. Verses 59 and 60, we see the obstacle of idolatry. And then in verses 61 and 62, we see the obstacle of instability. The three would-be disciples provide an object lesson for the first disciples about the nature of discipleship of true discipleship. 
Remember, Jesus is, is, as of verse 51, he set his face towards Jerusalem. What really would have only been probably less than a week's journey. But he's going to take a whole year to get there because those disciples have so much to learn about discipleship. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that year. Because that year of discipleship, where these disciples learned about discipleship, we also learn about discipleship. So it provides an example for those first disciples, and it also provides an example for us. These three would-be disciples provide an, an, an object lesson for us about the nature of true discipleship. As you'll see in our passage, we're not told what, what the, the final response of these men are. We're not told whether, whether they, they overcome the obstacles. But we must consider whether we have overcome the obstacles. We're not told their final decision. We must consider ours. We must consider whether we have truly become disciples. So then, first of all, the obstacle of worldliness in verses 57 and 58. As Jesus and the disciples are continuing on the road to Jerusalem, someone says to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. The parallel in Matthew reveals that this man is actually a scribe. That he is one of the, the prominent Jewish, Jewish religious, religious leaders, a, an expert in the Mosaic and Rabbinic law. And as we've seen already through Luke's gospel account, that the scribes have been presented as hostile to Jesus and his ministry. And that is going to, to continue, and the, the hostility is going to intensify as Jesus continues on this road towards Jerusalem. But not, it would seem, from this particular scribe. He has approached Jesus of his own volition. He has volunteered to make a commitment to follow Jesus and to follow him anywhere. Well, let's just dissect his statement for a moment. Notice that he, he does refer to Jesus as teacher. Now, this is a, a, this is a statement of, of showing honor to Jesus as the rabbi, but, but remember, in, in, in Jewish culture at that time, following a particular rabbi for, for a season and learning from him was, was common practice. And so it, there is a sense in which he's saying, I want to follow you. I want you to teach me. But Jesus isn't merely a teacher. Jesus isn't merely a rabbi. Jesus doesn't just want pupils. He wants disciples. He wants disciples. But he does say now, you know, now, he would follow Jesus wherever he went. It sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds like he's on the right track. Surely Jesus is thinking, how good it would be to have one of these guys who's been so against me to, to repent and now to be on my side. To, to one of these teachers of the law to show how, how the law pointed to me. To, to have this, this scribe join him as, as a disciple. Surely Jesus is saying, hey, this is great. So Jesus says to him, okay, pray this prayer. Repeat after me. Of course not. He doesn't do anything of the kind. Instead, he says the opposite. He replies, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He's saying that if I am not wealthy, if I do not have, have homes and means in this life, then, then my disciples, who would say they want to follow me, will, will follow in that as well. That we shouldn't expect anything different. He's saying that, that Jesus is saying that, that his personal situation is even worse than that of mere animals. At least foxes and birds have homes. But remember, Jesus does have a home. It's just not here. Jesus does have a home. He is a pilgrim and a stranger on this earth, as are we. And so, so Jesus isn't saying here, he's not saying that, that if you follow Jesus, you're going to be homeless. Okay, that's, 
that's, that's very unlikely, at least at this point in our culture. That may change. What Jesus is saying here is you need to live for another home. You need to live for your heavenly home. And, and for, a, for a religious Jew, for a scribe, this would have been radically countercultural. Because so much of the Jewish identity was and is wrapped up in possessing a piece of the promised land. And they did not understand that the promised land of Israel was a type representing the eternal promised land, the new heavens and the new earth. So it doesn't look like Jesus is, is here clearing the path for this scribe to follow him. It doesn't look like he's making it easier for the scribe to become a disciple. It looks like Jesus is raising up obstacles. It looks like Jesus is making it harder. It looks like Jesus is on the sales prevention team. But what Jesus is doing here is revealing the obstacle in the man's heart. Jesus is revealing that this man has the obstacle of worldliness in his heart. Jesus knew precisely what was going on in this man's heart. That's an insight that we don't have. We, we can't claim to know everything that's happening in another's heart. We can't even claim necessarily to know what's going on in our own heart. But Jesus does know. And so in his response, we see the real issue. We see that the real issue was the obstacle of worldliness. Obstacle of worldliness. Now, now the goal... In, in conversion. The goal in conversion is, is not to get someone to, to raise a hand or to walk an aisle or to pray a prayer. Now, I'm not saying that there is anything wrong with those things. But the issue is that someone, if they want to follow Jesus, they don't just follow him down an aisle, but they truly follow him wherever he goes. The issue is that, that people need to be born again. They need to be regenerated through the power of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. It's not about the external things you do. It's not about anything you can do. It's not even about saying, to, saying directly to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. It's about actually following him. So Jesus knows what is going on. He knows that, this, that worldliness is an obstacle that is keeping this man from following him. And so he, he knows that this man was focused on the things of this life. He knew that this man was not willing, at least at this point, to take up his cross and really follow Jesus wherever he went. So Jesus lovingly exposed the obstacle. Following Jesus means following Jesus wherever Jesus leads. Going wherever he calls you, doing whatever he has called you to do. And he has told you what he has called you to do from his holy word. In Luke 9, verses 23 to 25, remember we saw right after Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the first, that it was this Jesus' first announcement that he's going to suffer and be killed and resurrected. Verse 23, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? And so this man, unless he repented, in seeking to save his life, lost his life. Unless he repented and unless he, he realized what Jesus was saying here and actually turned and said, I will really follow you wherever you go, Jesus. He lost or forfeited himself. And the same is true for those who are listening today. Your excuses will not cut it on that day. For those of us who are truly born again, you will, you will look back on the things that you have sacrificed for the, the cause of Christ and, and rejoice over them. 
Rejoice over the fact that you don't have them anymore. They didn't keep you from following Jesus. But there will be some who will, will try to stand before God with all the things that they have collected, all the, the focus that they have had on what the world had to offer. We'll see that those things were like a hangman's noose that kept them from entering eternal life. Worldliness was an obstacle that these first disciples would need to recognize and overcome. Remember Judas? Judas was walking with Jesus. Judas, Judas was, was on the road with Jesus to Jerusalem. Judas heard all of these things. But Judas did not repent. Judas, Judas was consumed and destroyed by worldliness as he betrayed Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver. These disciples needed to learn the danger of worldliness, but it wouldn't just be a danger for them. It would also be a danger for the fledgling church that they sought to, to, to found. It remains an obstacle in the church to this day. Again, Jesus is not saying here that you must be homeless to be a disciple. Rather, he's saying that disciples do not live for this life. They do not live for, for anything that the world has to offer. But what is it that the world uses to entice you away from the path? What is keeping you from following Jesus? Worldly pleasures? Worldly entertainment? Worldly friends? Worldly goals? All of these things will keep you from following Jesus if you let them. But if by the grace of God you let go of these things, you let go of whatever it is that, is, that you're holding on to because you don't want to let anything be an obstacle to your love and service of Jesus, then you're proving yourself to be a true disciple. Now we know that this is an ongoing process, right? We know that it just doesn't happen like that and the, the, the snap of fingers or a blink of an eye. We know that, that at that moment of regeneration, our hearts are changed, but through progressive sanctification, the Lord continually reveals more and more things that we are allowing ourselves into our lives that keep us from Him. But sometimes, even, even we who have, have had those, those chains broken, it's like we, we grab those chains up and we wrap them around ourselves again. We put ourselves back into bondage to the world. 1 John 2, 15 to 17 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father but from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Similarly, John, James 4.4, 4, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity? Enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. Remember the parable of the soils that we looked at a few weeks ago in Luke 8. 13 and 14, that many will have life choked out because of the cares and riches and pleasures of life. You say you want to follow Jesus. Good. You must follow Jesus. You must follow Jesus wherever he leads. You must carry your cross and follow him. Now, carrying a cross is, is not just uh, about the discomforts and the problems that you face. Carrying your cross means laying down everything that gets in the way of following Jesus. Carrying your cross means crucifying your flesh. The true disciple 
must be ready to be despised and mistreated and slandered. The true disciple has laid down all his or her rights. The true disciple is at war with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And as I said last week, those enemies will give you no quarter. They will give you no mercy. Give them no mercy. The true disciple must share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 2.3 The true disciple would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 and 9. The true disciple lays down every weight and the sin which clings so closely and runs with endurance the race that is set before him, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Look to Jesus for your all. Pray for yourself. Pray for your brothers and your sisters at arms that, that we will all, through the power of the Holy Spirit, tear down the obstacle of worldliness. There's a second would-be disciple. It reveals another obstacle. The obstacle of idolatry, verses 59 and 60. This is related to the previous obstacle, but there are some nuances here. The obstacle of idolatry. So now this time, Jesus approaches this would-be disciple. And he says, follow me. Th this is the, the gospel call. Now, now we, we believe in this church in the, the effectual call that, that when the, the call of the gospel goes forth through the power of the Holy Spirit, that it works a, a change in the heart of the individual that they will turn and follow Jesus. We also see in God's word that many are called, but few are chosen. And again, the verdict is out, at least as far as our understanding goes, of what will actually happen to this would-be disciple. Again, it, it seems to start out well. This man calls Jesus Lord. He says, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. Now, it's, it's good to call Jesus Lord. Lord is an honorific. It is a, a term of respect. The man, when he says this, he's saying that, that Jesus has authority. And, he, and he's, he's saying here, make note of this, he's not saying specifically that Jesus is deity. As an aside, when you, you see in your Bible, when you see the word Lord in, in all capital letters, it's referring to the, the tetragrammaton, the, the, the four letters Yahweh. Y-H-W-H. -H, transliterated Yahweh. God, it's, it's, this is God's name that he has revealed to Moses at me, from Exodus chapter 3, which means I am. Okay, that's not what he's saying here. Or it's not in all capitals. He's referring to Jesus in, in, in an honorable way. He's implying that Jesus here has authority, and he's implying that Jesus has authority over him. But he doesn't just call Jesus Lord, does he? He says, but first, you're not my Lord now, but you will be my Lord then, after I do what I have to do. Friends, the question is not just about you calling Jesus Lord. The question is, is he actually your Lord? He is the Lord. But is he your Lord? Is he your Lord? Now at this point anyway, Jesus is not this man's Lord because of his excuse. Again, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. This, this actually sounds reasonable. Right? It, it, it actually sounds responsible. Especially in that cultural context where, where burying a father was an extremely important Jewish responsibility. It was a, a son's responsibility to, to, to bury his father when his father died. It's really an important responsibility in any culture. It seems at first glance like it's, it's a legitimate reason to delay following Jesus. 
Now, some commentators here suggest that this father has just died. Now, I really don't see how that can actually be the case because, because burying a, a relative in, that Jew, in the Jewish culture in that era was something that took place really quite quickly after death. And so this man would have been consumed with, with preparations for burial, not to mention that he would have been consumed with grief. And so his father, having, if his father had just died, it would have been very unlikely that this man would have been, would have been out and about and they would have, even, would have even encountered Jesus. But even more important and pertinent is that, that if his father had died, then this man would have become, he would have been ceremonially unclean for seven days because he had come into contact with a dead body, Numbers 19.11. And so such a person would not be out in public except for the funeral. I believe that the case here is that this, this father was, was aged or ill. And the son did not want to leave until his father had passed away. And again, that does seem like a reasonable request. After all, the fifth commandment says that we are to honor our father and mother. But either way, whether the man's father was dead or sick or aged, he had misplaced priorities. He had misplaced priorities. So again, we see what is taking place in the response of Jesus to the excuse. Jesus tells him directly that his priorities are out of whack. So look at the response in verse 60. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. This sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? What Jesus is saying here is that let, lo- let those who are spiritually dead... Bury those who are physically dead. Jesus is not saying here that it is wrong to go to a funeral. This is a rhetorical response. And and its its bluntness is intended to reveal just how much discipleship requires. Jesus is using hyperbole. He's exaggerating to make a point. And Jesus does this often in his teaching, even in dealing with this this same principle of not putting family above him. In Luke 14, 26, Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now again, Jesus is not saying here that you have to literally hate your family. That would be a a contradiction to other clear passages of Scripture. Again, you you need to compare compare Scripture with Scripture. This is one of the most important rules of biblical hermeneutics, of the the proper interpretation of the Bible. You compare Scripture with Scripture. Jesus is saying here that, that in order to be a disciple, you must love him far, far more than anyone or anything else even your own family, and even your own life. Far more than any of those things. In fact, your love for Jesus is to be so great that in comparison, your love for anything else in this life is like hatred. Frederick Danker comments, Many a would-be follower of Jesus has pleaded the requirements of social obligation or prior business demands as an excuse for not meeting the imperative of obedience. Jesus rejects all such excuses. Jesus is saying to the man again, let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. He says, but you go and proclaim the, the kingdom of God. So let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead so that you can focus on proclaiming life. That must be your priority. Living for the kingdom must be your priority. Proclaiming the gospel must be your priority. And it must be your priority as well. As Martin Luther said, let goods and kindred go. This moral life also. There is nothing in this life that compares to the value of Jesus Christ. Nothing. Even the whole world. 
could be given to you would not compare to the value of Jesus Christ and loving and serving him. And as you, you cultivate through, through the, the study of God's word and prayer and fellowship with, other, with the saints, as you cultivate the love for Jesus in your heart, you'll find the things of this world will lose their shine. They, they will cease to have the appeal to you that they once did. You'll see your sin disappearing and you'll start to see the other things that distract you from, from worshiping and serving Jesus, fading from the importance of your life. To everyone who hears the gospel, Jesus is saying, follow me. In fact, Jesus is saying, follow me to those even who have not heard the gospel. When Jesus says, follow me, it is a present tense imperative. You must follow me. You must follow me now. The command to follow Jesus is always a present tense imperative. This man has just told Jesus that he wants to follow him, but not yet. He, he's saying he wants to delay becoming a disciple. Now, when we're trying to, to train our children, we tell them to obey right away, all the way, in a happy way. Delayed disobedience is disobedience. Delayed discipleship is not discipleship. This man is stumbling on the obstacle of misplaced priorities. This man is struggling on the obstacle of idolatry. He's putting his, his father ahead of Jesus. He's loving his father more than he's loving Jesus. Now, Jesus' disciples needed to understand the danger of misplaced priorities. They themselves would face this obstacle. And those to whom they ministered would also face this obstacle. Long after, when, when Peter, in, in the book of Galatians, we find Peter who is, is, is putting the Judaizers ahead of Jesus as he's unwilling to eat with the Gentiles in front of them because of fear of their response. And so it earned Peter Paul's rebuke. So thankfully, we, it's, it's not about perfection, but it's, it's about continuing to, to let go of these things, to let go of idolatry in your heart, of continually overcoming the obstacle. I wonder, do you put people ahead of following Jesus? Maybe it's your parents. I, I've seen that happen when, when people will not take a stand on, on certain things that they know to be right because they do not want to offend their parents. I, I've seen people who, as, as adults, were interested in, in missions work but bowed to their parents' pressure and didn't go. Or, or maybe it's your children that you put before Jesus. I think that's a big one in our culture. Now, parents should love their, their children, but, but too easily they, they put their children on a pedestal. I remember a man once telling me that he would sin to protect his children. He did. And his family is still reaping the negative effects of that. I've seen many people also influenced by, by peers or boyfriends or girlfriends into sinful behavior. Listen, putting anyone, even yourself, ahead of following Jesus is simply idolatry. It's not just people we idolize. We, we can make an idol out of anything. John Calvin said that the human heart is a factory of idols. We churn out idols like Mattel churns out Barbies. Furthermore, you can't be the child or parent or spouse or friend that Jesus calls you to be unless you love him more than you love them. Do you, do you put other things ahead of following Jesus? Men and women say, I will follow Jesus, but first I want to establish my career or, or build my savings or whatever. Young people do this too. They, they say, I'll follow Jesus once I've gotten older, once I've experienced what life, and meaning sin, has to offer. Life is a vapor. You do not know what tomorrow will bring. You may not have the opportunity to follow Jesus tomorrow because you may not have tomorrow. You may not have tomorrow. Again, even people who claim to be Christians do this. 
They, they put other things ahead of Jesus. People often give to Jesus whatever is left over of their time and their talents and their treasure. They, they don't serve or give like Jesus requires because they are too busy worshiping their idols. They don't tell people about Jesus because they're worried about what people will think of them. They don't evangelize because they, they don't want to offend their family or their friends or their neighbors or their coworkers. Is that you? Are, are you putting other things ahead of following Jesus? Are you putting anything ahead of following Jesus? Are your priorities out of whack? Are you an idolater? Does Jesus occupy the throne of your heart or are other things vying for, your, for that position? There's a third would-be disciple. And in him we see the obstacle of instability. Verses 61 and 62. This disciple, disciple a would-be disciple, says, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me say farewell to those at my home. Like the first would-be disciple, this one approaches Jesus. He's of his own volition. Like the second would-be disciple, this one calls Jesus Lord. And his response is similar to the second would-be disciple as well. He says, I'll, you know, I'll follow you, Jesus, but first let me go and say goodbye to my family. Again, at first glance, this seems reasonable. It seems reasonable. Th there's really nothing wrong with saying goodbye to your family. There's even a biblical example of this. In, in 1 Kings 19.20, remember when, when Elijah calls Elisha, Elisha says that he will, follow, he will follow Elijah, but he says, but first let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. So we have an example in Scripture of somebody doing just this. Now there's another important hermeneutical lesson here. Listen carefully. Events do not set precedent. Events do not set precedent. Let me explain what I mean. Just because something is presented in a biblical narrative does not mean we are supposed to or allowed to, or we are allowed to follow that example. Similarly, I'd say this, descriptive texts are not prescriptive. Okay, descriptive texts are not prescriptive. When the Bible describes something as taking place, again, you need to look at the context to see whether God approves of it or not. In this particular case with Elisha, we're not told. We're not told. We can't use Elisha as an example say, well, I'm first going to go and, and, and say goodbye to my parents before I follow Jesus. Because when you look at the broader context of Scripture, when you consider the whole counsel of God's Word, you see an example that is exactly, exactly the, the contrary. Again, we're not told whether Elisha did the right thing or the wrong thing in saying goodbye to his family. And furthermore, the context is different. Because one more important than Elijah is here. Even if Elijah did allow it, it does not mean that it would be appropriate in this particular situation. And this is another danger of relying on narratives without considering the whole counsel of God's word. And I see people run afoul of this sort of thing quite often as they, they pull verses out of context and make application that they are not meant, to application, not meant to make application of because it does not apply to them directly. Well, like the second would-be disciple, this one also had misplaced priorities. He should have listened to what Jesus had said to the second one, and considered whether he himself was making his family an obstacle for discipleship. But again, like the second would-be disciple, he calls Jesus Lord. And like the second would-be disciple, he also wants to delay discipleship. He says, I will follow you, but first. But first. He's called Jesus Lord, but clearly Jesus is not his Lord. The words but and Lord do not go together. There is no but Lord. 
If Jesus is your Lord, you will do what he says, whatever he says. Otherwise, he is not your Lord. If Jesus is not your Lord, he is not your Savior. Now again, the question comes, is it, is it necessarily wrong to say goodbye to your family? But again, we need to think about the fact that Jesus was addressing this particular man in this particular circumstance and the particular issues of his heart. Jesus knew what is going on in his heart, so listen to his response in, in verse 60, 62. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Again, it's, it's in Jesus' response that we see that, that though the problem presents it, itself similarly to the second would-be disciple, the, the obstacle wasn't exactly the same. It wasn't so much idolatry as instability. This man is vacillating. And Jesus knows that he's vacillating in his, in his heart, that he was double-minded, that in his saying, I want to go back, he's thinking about returning to the life that he once had. He's, he's yearning for the life that he had before. Again, he's double-minded. You cannot single-mindedly follow Jesus half-heartedly. It doesn't make any sense. Again, James 1.8, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We have numerous examples of this in Scripture. Consider Lot's wife in, in Genesis 19. As the angel warned them to, to, to flee and not to look back, remember, Lot's wife looked back as Sodom and Gomorrah were being destroyed by God. And looking back, she was yearning for the life that she had left behind, supposedly had left behind in Sodom. Jesus will use her as a warning against turning back in Luke 17, 32. He says, remember Lot's wife. Or think about the children of Israel. After they've been delivered so powerfully from Egypt through the, the signs that, that God had given, they, in Numbers 11, they looked back. They looked back to the fish and the cucumbers and the, the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic of Egypt. They wanted to go back to the bondage of Egypt because they found the challenges of following God in the wilderness difficult. And when we look back, when this man looked back, we're, we're nothing better than them. This man's request is, is no better than, than Augustine's unregenerate prayer. Grant me chastity and continence, but not yet. Grant me chastity and continence, but not yet. Augustine later reflects after his conversion. He says, for I was afraid lest, lest thou shouldst hear me too soon and too soon cure me of my disease of lust, which I desired to have satisfied rather than extinguished. Do we say, Jesus, I will follow you in whatever it is, but not yet? If that's true, we are not true disciples. Are you praying that Jesus would help you to overcome sin, but not yet? Don't even bother praying that prayer. Don't even bother. Now, there are all kinds of reasons why people are double-minded. There are all kinds of reasons how, uh, why people reveal instability. Not to pick on Peter again, but he provides uh, for us a, a, a an apt illustration. As Peter wavers in his commitment to Jesus and denies Jesus three times after Jesus' arrest. He wavers because of the pressure and even the, the, the pressure of a mere slave girl. Now, thankfully, Peter repented and was restored. True disciples are capable of instability. We're not talking about, about somebody who's shaky. We have some shaky saints among us. I am sometimes a shaky saint. But by God's grace, for myself and I trust for you, that, that in those times when you, when you are, are tempted to look back and when you, you do look back, Joshua calls such people shoulder checkers. When, when you look back over your shoulder at, at your past life, by God's grace, I trust you repent. And get back on the path and back to following Jesus. Now, 
people of Providence Baptist Church. I feel like I need to talk to you personally for a moment. Because I have some concern. I have con some concern over spiritual apathy that I see in some of this in this church. Now again, we all, we all are capable of spiritual apathy at times. But have you forgotten your first love? H have you forgotten what, what it means to strive to enter by the narrow way? Have you forgotten that in your striving, you find it as God's grace? Does that work in you to will and to work according to his good pleasure? H have you gotten lazy about practicing the means of grace that, that God has, has given to you, chiefly among them, study of God's word and, and prayer and fellowship? I'm concerned. I'm concerned when I see these things in myself, and I'm concerned when I see these things in you as well. May the Lord help us all to strive to enter the narrow gate. May the Lord help us all by his grace to help us to overcome obstacles, whether it's these obstacles of worldliness and idolatry and stability, or any other obstacle that throws itself in our way against following Jesus. Have you repented uh, of your past sins? Or are they even your past sins? Are they actually the sins of your present? Remember, repentance is a change of heart that leads to a change of behavior. I've used this illustration several times before, but, but if if I am, if I want to go to Vancouver on the bus, and I've taken the bus to Vancouver a lot, if I want to go to Vancouver on the bus, but I instead get on the bus to Calgary, I'm going in the wrong direction. Now, some, someone says to me, where are you going? I said, Vancouver. They say, you're on the wrong bus. I said, no, it's okay, we'll get there. You'll never actually get there unless you get off the bus. I got on the bus that's going in the right direction. That is repentance. That is repentance. A change of heart that leads to a change in behavior. These things keep people from following Jesus. And they, altogether, they can keep people, real disciples, from persevering, at least for a short time. What we see here in these, these first would-be disciples, or these, these, these would-be disciples is applicable to those first disciples, and it's applicable to us. As you consider these obstacles, as you consider how you engage with these obstacles and, and whether you're overcoming these obstacles by God's grace, you can be asking yourself, are you a disciple? Are you a true disciple? In Philippians 3, I'm going to read verses 12 to 16. Philippians 3, 12 to 16. Not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think in this way. If anything, you would think otherwise, God would reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, run, run to win the prize of the unperishable wreath. Follow Jesus on the road to Jerusalem. For the path to heaven leads through Jerusalem. It led through Jerusalem for Jesus as it was in Jerusalem that he was rejected by men and suffered and died for the sins of his people. It was in Jerusalem where he was raised from the grave on the third day. It was in Jerusalem where he ascended to heaven and where he's now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Follow Jesus on the road to Jerusalem. Follow Jesus on the road through Jerusalem to heaven. Your eternal home.
Think of the, the children's song, I have decided to follow Jesus. You probably know it. I had decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still follow. No turning back, no per- turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Do not let anything deter or distract or delay you from following Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we praise you for this example. We praise you for in this example, we see a warning. We see a warning not just to those first disciples, but also to us. That we would examine ourselves to see whether we are indeed in the faith, to examine ourselves to see whether we are true disciples. To see whether by your grace we are overcoming the obstacles of of worldliness and idolatry and instability and a host of other obstacles. Lord Jesus, we, we know that we do not come to you on the basis of our merits, but on the basis of your merits. Lord, I pray that you would work in hearts to reveal the reality of our relationship with you. Lord, I pray that by your spirit you would reveal our shortcomings and and help us through the power of your spirit to overcome them. Lord, I pray if there are those who have false assurance of salvation that they would repent and truly follow Jesus and have a sure assurance. And Lord, even if there there are those who are here who have a a guilty conscience, but who are truly saved, that you would cause them, yes, to repent of whatever that is they need to repent of, but to have, again, a confidence and assurance based not upon themselves, but upon your perfect saving work. Help us all, I pray, to follow you wherever you lead. For our glory, for the building of your church, and for the advance of your kingdom. We pray this in your precious name.